Well, good morning, church. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and let's pray and get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everyone here, the opportunity that we have to spend time in your word. I pray that it would transform us from the inside out and that we would become more like you. In your name we pray, and everyone said? Amen. Amen. Well, some of you might have some driving coming up. And a great way to spend time in the car is to work on riddles. I enjoy riddles. I'm not very good at them, but I have a couple riddles up here to to go over. The first is this, and um, first hour, they were pretty good on these. If a farmer has five haystacks in one field and four haystacks in the other, how many haystacks would he have if he combined them all in another field? Any ideas? I see, yeah, the ding, 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 one, that is the correct answer. You take the five, the four, you put them all together, you got one. Next one, I like this one. How far can a dog run into the woods? Oh, you guys have seen these before. Yes, halfway, because then you start running out of the woods. And then we have this one. Um... I make you weak at the worst of all times. I keep you safe. I keep you fine. I make your hands sweat and your heart grow cold. I visit the weak, but seldom the bold. We could be here for a while on this one. Ah, good guess. This one is fear. Fear is what we are talking about today, and fear creates a riddle of its own. It's something that we all experience and we all face. If you were to look at different surveys on people's top fears, there's certain ones that rotate. Snakes and bugs, uh, clowns and zombies, uh, the fear of public speaking, all these different fears kind of rotate at the top. And I have my fears. I remember as a a freshman in uh, high school, I was on a a missions trip to Mexico. I was doing the work project in the morning, and my youth pastor came up to me and said, John, tonight, tonight is the night that you're going to share your testimony at the outreach at the church. And as a freshman in high school, I was terrified of public speaking. I hated the idea. I immediately got anxious. I had to run to the bathroom because I had the runs, and it wasn't because of the water I drank. I was freaking out. I was so concerned. I practiced like a hundred times. I was nervous. I was sweaty. I couldn't eat. And finally, it was time. The church, I mean, it was packed with people. We did some songs and some skits, and then it was my turn to come up. I remember walking up to the stage, shaking, grabbing the mic, trying to hold it steady. And I brought it up to to my mouth to speak, and I said, good evening. My name is John! And my voice totally cracked. And Okay, I'm a freshman in high school in front of my peers and all these people. Like, this is worst nightmare moment. I'm terrified. I barely am able to make it through the rest of the talk. I don't even know what I said. I couldn't wait to get off the stage. When it was done, I ran off. I ran out the doors, and I went, and I sat on a bench and started crying, and I promised that I would never do anything like that again. (laughs) We're afraid. We have our fears. I mean, it's true of me in high school, paralyzed by what other people thought. And it's even true of me today. Most of us fear other people. We're fearful of being exposed. We're fearful of um, being put down, for people attacking us. And we don't like it. Like, we want to live a fearless life, don't we? Like, we long to be free, but yet, how do we crack the riddle? Like, what is the answer to the riddle of fear? How do we make progress? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're in 1 Peter. We've been in 1 Peter on and off throughout, since, since the spring, really, some different series in there. We just got done with a series on roll call and submission and where to yield so that you don't collide. And we're starting a new series today, Following Jesus to the Cross. And over the next three weeks, we'll be looking at these different ways that we can follow Jesus and what does it mean to follow him in fear. 
And so 1 Peter, if you've been around for a while, the themes of the book are starting to take root in your heart. You have this church, this, this, these people of believers throughout modern-day Turkey and Asia Minor, and they, they are experiencing suffering, like life is hard. And Peter, he looks on the horizon, and he sees deeper, darker storm clouds brewing, coming into land, and he continues to tell the church to take heart, to have hope, because things are turning, not for the better, but continuing to turn for the worse. And so how does the church live when they're suffering? And how do they have hope? So that's what 1 Peter is all about. We're in verses 13 and 14 in 1 Peter chapter 3, and I invite you to follow along on the screens as I read here these verses. It starts off with saying this, now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Peter starts with like the hitting blessing of suffering for doing what's right. That's been the context all along, suffering for righteousness' sake. And when that happens, you are worthy to persevere to experience what Jesus experienced here. And the, the blessing that comes of this is you are becoming more and more like Christ. And Peter can say with such confidence, as he says in verse 14, do not fear them, because he knows that the very worst thing that can happen to you if you suffer for doing what's good is that suffering will lead you to become more like Christ and thus be blessed. And so it is with confidence that Peter says, do not fear them. What Peter is doing here is he's actually quoting uh, from the prophet Isaiah. If we go back to the Old Testament and this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 8, think of a more relevant passage today than what the beginning part of verse 12 says. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Conspiracy theories have always been around since the dawn of time, and we are not exempt of that today. These conspiracies are all around us, part of our daily lives. Don't let your hearts be wrapped around the dark drama of social and political conspiracy. When we do that, it is like a thick fog coming into the valley that makes us lose our reference point on what matters and our hope. Do not let our perspectives get caught up into these messes. So there is no need to concern yourself if the royal family is actually lizard people. And there's no reason to worry and wonder if Tupac is still alive, chilling in Cuba. We, we have a higher calling. In Isaiah 8, 13, it continues to, to say this, do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. And verse 13 says, but the Lord of hosts, him shall you honor as holy. This verse centers us. It's like, oh yeah, I mean, it's the cell phone notification, ding! Like, yeah, the Lord of hosts, the one who is holy, the one who is set apart, the one who is a cut above. That is our attention. That is where our focus goes. The Lord alone, the ruler in heaven and all that is upon it. The Lord alone, the ruler of earth and all that is on it. The Lord alone, the ruler of the sea and all that is in it. That is where our fear heads. So no need to be concerned with the new world order because God is the one world, one king ruler. And there's no reason to get all caught up in these different dramas and these different things that take place. I mean, it really comes down to trust. And who are you going to trust? Like, are you going to trust some random person that remains anonymous on internet chat room sites? Are you going to trust the Lord Almighty who was, who is, who will always be? 
where the heavens declare the glory of his name, where the skies proclaim the works of his hands, where day after day they pour forth speech and night after night they display honor. He and he alone is the famous one, the holy one, and he is to be our concern. And man, I love this part here because it tells us what to actually do with fear because fear needs to go somewhere. In certain senses, we are created to fear. And it, if we just take it and bottle it up in us, it's like taking a two liter bottle of Coke and shaking it up and waiting for it to explode, leaving us with a big mess to clean up. And so we got to send fear somewhere God's word tells us where to send it. So in verse 13, after it says, the Lord, the host, the Holy One, this one that is set apart, the end of verse 13 says, let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. That is where fear goes. That's where it all gets channeled and taken to, to him and him alone. People, like this is the answer to the riddle. This is what we've been looking for. This is how we solve the puzzle of fear. Fear goes to God. That is where we send it. That is where we channel it. The answer is not less, it's more. The answer is not no, it's more. The answer is more fear. We need more fear just like we need more cowbell. We need it. We need fear. And why do we need that? Because when we have fear for God, we have no fear for them. I'm going to say that one more time. When we have fear, more fear for God, we have no fear of them. The answer. So what does this then all mean? What happens when we channel, when we place and put our fear in God, where we dread more the idea of not trusting God and his promises, where we are more afraid of not keeping his commands than the perseverance, than the persecution that comes from others. What happens when we do that? Verse 14. Remarkable. And he will become a sanctuary. So when we channel our fear to the one true God, we're honoring him, and the idea of not becomes our dread. Our fear of God leads us to the sanctuary of God. And what does sanctuary mean? Sanctuary is a safe place. Sanctuary is a holy spot. Like sanctuary is refuge and strength. Do you guys realize what this means? God's fear is unlike anything on the planet. Because our fear of God drives us to God's presence where we sprint to him and every other type of fear causes us to run and to hide years ago I was on a bike ride late at night I have no idea why I was out there it was late it was cold it was windy and I was riding on this path that was in kind of this rough part of town and as I was riding my bike I came along someone else who was also on a bike ride late at night And I was going a little faster than he was. And so I was passing him. And as I passed him, he looked up and went, boo. And he was wearing a clown-like mask. (laughs) I have never pedaled faster in my entire life. I was getting out of there. I was flying. I was terrified. I was so scared. Every other type of fear on the planet causes us to run or to fight. But the fear of God drives us to his sanctuary and to his presence where he is our safe place, not our prosecutor. That is the fear of God. 
So what does then this fear lead to? Let's jump back here into 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Now, verse 15, it's still quoting Isaiah 8. We've talked about this, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. We talked about holy, set apart, a cut above. Um, unlike anything else, dedicated to, those are all these ideas of holiness. Um, and so we honor Christ with our heart. And then it continues to say this, verse 15, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So what does more fear lead to? More fear leads to more preparation. Always being prepared for what? To give the reason for the hope that you have. Now the word there for defense is where we get the word apologetic. Many of you are familiar with that term and what usually hops into our mind with that is this high level elite academic study where you look at historical evidence and philosophical debates and archeological digs and you get all this evidence to strengthen your faith and hope that some atheist then believes. This is a, such a valuable thing for the church, this academic, apologetic defense of our faith. And I am so thankful that we have a truckload of evidence that supports the claims of Scripture. It's amazing. I'm thankful and I praise God for the people who've dedicated their lives for this type of study. So valuable for the church. But what can happen is this idea of academic study for many can feel unapproachable, where you feel insecure, like that you could never measure up, that you could never know enough. But how Peter uses this, this idea for defense in our faith and of our faith is our personal story, what God has done in us. And then think of the context. These people are going through intense persecution. They're suffering. Peter's saying, be prepared because more fear leads to more preparation. And people will see that we have what they don't have. And they'll ask, how are you not freaking out when you're losing your job and your money and your house and your health even your life, what is different in you? Peter's saying, be ready, be prepared. And my question for you is, are you ready? Are you prepared to give the reason for the hope that you have? And what is that reason? The hope that you have is right there. In verses 15, Christ the Lord is holy. That's the hope that we have. Christ the Lord is holy. That word prepare, that word means before you go public. And so we must talk about today, does your public life match your private life? Does the way that the community sees you, does that match what your family sees and your kids see? Does it match when no one sees your public life in order with your private life, having private victories before you have public victories. I hope that all of you study apologetics and grow in that field. And where you start with defense and apologetics is you start with your own personal character. My own experience and my own observation is that, yeah, people uh, would like to know certain answers and questions, but people are much more likely to run and walk away from God, not because we squirm when we try to answer the question of what is the Trinity and how that doctrine works. And it's not so much when we get tongue-tied and explaining how a loving God allows evil and suffering and hell and those kind of things. What causes more people to walk away is when Christians say one thing and they do something entirely different. And so we must be prepared. 
with our private personal character and let God transform our hearts to be more like him in private so that we can give an answer for the hope that we have that Jesus is Lord and he's holy. And we are asked. And we don't get prepared once we're asked because if we do, no one's going to be asking us. So more fear leads to more preparation. Next, we come to these four verses, verses 18 through 22. We're going to put these on the screen. This is a big chunk of scripture. And a couple of disclaimers before we unpack a couple points here on this is there are a lot of confusing facets of this passage. I mean, just look at verse um, 19 and 20 in which he went, this is Jesus, which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. What in the world does that mean? Proclaiming in prison these spirits. Try answering the who, what, where, when, why, and how on that one. Luther himself said, I don't know what this passage means. It's a very particular and confusing passage. I cannot know what it means, all right? It's, it's crazy. There, some speculate that there are 180 different views or variation of views of what this passage means. So I hope you brought lunch. Let's get started. If you want to know more about this, Thomas Schreiner, in his commentary on 1 Peter, lays out three of the most popular views and argues for his favorite one. It's really, really good, and it stretches your mind. And if that's something that interests you more, I'd encourage you to check it out. The other thing that can be confusing is what it says in verse 21. Uh, if we can bring that back up here on the screen. So baptism, which corresponds to this next slide, now saves you. That can make our heart stop a little bit. Like what? This baptism, sacred waters, that saves us? How, do, how does that work? This is not um, teaching that salvation, the forgiveness of sin, comes through like these special water, magical waters of baptism. That's not what it's saying. Baptism is like an outward sign of an inward change. And as we mentioned earlier, we're going to be celebrating that next week. And baptism reminds us that unless that we have been, unless we're rescued and brought back out, uh, out of the water, that we would be dead in our sins. And so baptism, it, it doesn't save us. It shows us that we're saved. In this passage, it's clear that we are saved by faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's a couple things that I want to say as well with these verses. So these verses lay out that more fear leads to more gospel. These verses, as confusing as they can be, they are also crystal clear in the gospel, the good news of Jesus. It starts out with, for Christ, he came, he manifested himself, he made himself known, and he suffered. That Did you catch this in the text? That he might bring us to God so that we could be in his presence. And after being put to death, he was made alive by the Spirit. He was resurrected. He was brought back to life, conquering sin, evil, and death. And he has gone into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, and he has made and brought into the subjection under his feet all the beings, both the natural and the supernatural ones, are under his reign and his rule. What this means is that Jesus kicks butt. He's victorious. He is the one that def defeats sin, evil, Satan, the demons. He is our victor. He wins once and for all. And he doesn't have to worry about losing to his rival next year. He's victorious forever and ever. More fear leads to more gospel. Third, with where this fear of God leads to, what it brings, what it does. More fear leads to more preparation. More fear leads to more gospel. And now we'll see that more fear 
leads to more hope. If we could put this big passage up again, 18 there. Where is it? Let's see. Okay, right before verse 21, we read this. In which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Why would Peter put that there? He puts that there to give hope. In the days of Noah, where so much evil was raging, God rescued eight people. Like such a small number of people, God rescued eight people from the waters of judgment in the ark. And just again, imagine what the church is going through, what what's they're experiencing, how small they must have felt, insignificant in the Roman Empire, with pain and suffering and judgment seemingly around every corner, how small they must have felt. And Peter puts this in here to give them hope that no matter what you're experiencing, God is able to rescue his people and rescue his church from judgment. And we see that in the days of Noah as God rescues these eight people from the judgment of water. And we see that in the days of Abraham where God rescues Lot and his two daughters from the judgment of fires of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see this in the day of Moses where God rescues the small, tiny, insignificant people from the most powerful nation on the planet as they were slaves in Egypt. And we see this in the days of Gideon where God takes 32,000 people, soldiers, and whittles it down to 300, and he uses them to rescue the people from the Midianite armies. And we see this in the days of David where God uses a small shepherd boy to conquer the mighty Philistine giant. And we see this in the days of Elijah where God uses his one prophet to conquer the 450 prophets of Baal. And we see this in the days of Jesus when God uses a poor carpenter to rescue the world from sin. So no matter how massive the opposition seems to be, he can save his people in the most stunning ways. And we are to take heart with more fear. More fear leads us to more hope. So what's the answer to the riddle? What do we need for the riddle of fear? We don't need less, we need more. We need more fear. And what does that lead us to? More fear leads us to more preparation. More fear leads us to more gospel. And more fear leads us to more hope. So how do we then put this into practice? How do we live this out? How do we change and become more like Christ? I want to give two ideas. One is broad and general, and the other is acutely specific. So the first is to grow in your understanding of God's holiness. Day by day, moment by moment, little by little, have this pursuit and understanding God's holiness more thoroughly. I know in my life I can take my relationship with God just too casually. We serve a holy God and understanding that and the depths and the nuances, the maturation process of that is like a, a fine wine. It just takes time. And so be committed to that. Pay attention to when you're reading about the Ark of the Covenant and when you're reading uh, about the Holy of Holies and when you're looking at Isaiah in the temple and the list can go on and on and on. Be devoted to growing and understanding God's holiness and what that means. And don't look for that transformation to take place overnight. So that's, that's the first one. The next one is really, really specific. And I, it might just apply to me. I've been percolating on this thought for a while. And it, it has to do with the word awesome. And I'm finally ready to commit to this. 
I use, I use awesome all the time. That quarterback is awesome. Taylor Swift's new album is awesome. The potatoes, mashed potatoes and gravy was awesome. And the word awesome means worthy of awe. And God alone is the one who is worthy. And if everything is awesome, nothing is awesome. And I think subconsciously what I've done is I've watered down that idea. This idea of a holy God. And so what I'm going to be trying to do is I'm going to try to designate the word awesome solely for the nature of God. Let's see how it goes. So I, just to be clear, I haven't done this yet. Something I want to put into practice and see if it helps. And then I got a free one as well. Lastly, do yourself a favor. You have a good laugh. If you haven't seen the SNL skit of Will Ferrell playing the cowbell, you got to go Google this and listen to, look at that guy, all right? And as you're, watching, as you're watching this video where the producer comes back and says, what I really need, what I really want is more cowbell. You're going to replace that in your mind, and you're going to replace that what you really need is more fear, more fear of God. What your life needs is more fear. More fear. That's the answer to the riddle. Not less, but more. And through our fear of God, where we dread the idea of not trusting his promises, it will lead us to more preparation, more gospel, and more hope. Every time I, I get the opportunity to speak, I still get nervous. I still get afraid. Usually around Thursday when I'm driving home from work, I have my freak out moment when it's a week that I'm preaching. And I'm just like, I'm a mess. I, I come undone. I was like, God, I cannot do this. You have the wrong guy. You need to find someone else. This is not happening. And I become keenly aware of my weaknesses and my fear and how I need God's help. And each time that I have the privilege to come up here and with fear and trembling, open up the word of God and pray that I'm faithful and helpful. Each time that happens, I grow just a little bit in understanding what it means to fear God. And slowly, piece by piece, bit by bit, I can make progress in understanding what it means to fear God. And if God can do this in me, he can do that in you. Whatever your fears are, whatever makes your heart race, makes you anxious, God has something better for you. And that's fear in him. And so in those areas of your life where there's a bunch of noise and chaos and music stands are being kicked over, remember that God is coming into your life and he's looking you in the eye and he's saying, you know what you need? You need more fear. Because when we have more fear of God, we have no fear of them. Let's pray. Lord, we need you. We need your help. You are such a good and holy God. Lord, I pray for the people here who are gripped in fear.
Lord, I pray that they would see a way out. That they would see that their fear can go to you and that you will be their sanctuary, their hope. Lord, I pray for your grace and mercy in their lives. That you would encourage their hearts to take step by step into understanding your holiness better. Lord, if there's anyone here who is running from you, I pray that you would draw them back to your, yourself. Lord, those here like me who've been just too lax with our relationship with you and too buddy-buddy, Lord, captivate us by your awe. Remind us of how truly awesome you are. So, Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.